It's time for Good Game Spawn Point. And welcome back, Ryan. Oh, thanks, guys. I can't wait to tell you all about the huge esports event I went to in Canada. It was the trip of a lifetime, from the pro gaming <laughs> to the poutine. Stick around to the end of the show to find out more about that. Ah, sounds awesome, and we sure will. Not the least because we have some games to review. There's the platformer that's better than actual guacamole, Guacamelee 2. <laughs> Plus the medical mayhem of Hospital Sim 2 Point Hospital. And I'll tell you all you need to know about video game speedruns. Oh, well, let's keep things fast then and get right into it. What? Rad, the first Guacamelee was a super colourful and surprisingly complex action platformer that introduced us to Juan, a simple agave farmer turned superhero wrestler. Well, Goose, now it's time to once again don the mythical luchador mask and step back into the ring for the sequel, Guacamelee Dos. OK. That means two. Oh, hey! It's been seven years since Juan defeated the evil Carlos Calaca, saving the people of Mexico and rescuing the love of his life, Lupita. Since then, he's hung up his wrestling tights and settled down to live the quiet life and raise a family. But things don't stay quiet for long. While he's out on an important quest, shopping for avocados, mysterious portals begin appearing all over town, releasing a batch of bad Esqualitos, as well as a familiar four-legged friend who convinces you to travel with him to save the Mexiverse. It is a totally crazy way to kick off an adventure, and I'd even say there are a few too many faces popping up at once, but I did like how it all quickly spins out of control. After jumping through a few humorous universes, you eventually find your way to the darkest timeline, where a council of Chivos, uh, the Goat Guy, have brought you, the last surviving Juan, to defeat Salvador, a sickly wrestler who believes he can achieve eternal life by stealing three ancient relics that hold the key to create the sacred guacamole. I mean, sure, it sounds ridiculous, but thanks to the game's amazing art style and music, it all pulls you into its world like a crazy Mexican fever dream. <laughs> It's stunning to look at, isn't it? And the good news is, it plays as good as it looks. The tight, responsive controls from the original are back, and they feel better than ever. And you'll need to truly master them to have any chance of recovering the stolen relics from some particularly tough temples. Each new area you visit is made up of tricky platforming sections mixed with enemy encounters. And often, you'll be locked in with them until you defeat them all. Or, should I say, they're locked in with you. The combat here is so satisfying. Hits land with a solid thwack, and often fights will require you to juggle multiple enemies at once. Luckily, as a wrestler, you can utilize powerful grapples, throws, and punch combos. And as your journey continues, you'll unlock Mucho's extra moves to add to your repertoire, such as the rooster uppercut, the dash punch, even the ability to turn into a chicken with its own super moves. Not only do these moves come in handy during a brawl, but they're also essential for navigating particular areas of the world. Just another example of that classic Metroidvania gameplay, which seems to be popping up in games more and more nowadays. Did you know the statues you break to unlock your abilities in Guacamole are actually nods to the original Metroid on the Nintendo Entertainment System? In fact, there are quite a few hidden Easter eggs that show off these developers' appreciation for classic video game design over the ages. <laughs> I do love a bit of nostalgia, and it certainly seems like Metroidvania is the big trend this year. And the Guacamelee series really does embrace the genre. I particularly appreciated how well everything is marked out in the map. I never found myself lost or without a heading. Plus, you eventually unlock fast travel statues to avoid spending too long traveling between towns and hubs. Yeah. New in this sequel is four-player co-op, which lets you bring along twice as many players as in the original game. And having players drop in and out is a great way to help deal with the tough fights and tricky platforming sections. Because as long as at least one player is still alive, you can keep respawning infinitely. Also, fighting alongside old man Chivo is hilarious. You know, Red, I actually found having more compadres made the game a little harder. Specifically platforming areas that use interdimensional rifts and fast-moving hazards. More often than not, we would just fluke our way to the next screen or get stuck dying over and over again. 
I mean, it made for some fun chuckles, but I'm not sure it's the ideal way to appreciate some of this fantastic level design. Yeah, that is true. Plus, it can make it hard to keep track of where you are on screen. So messy. So loco. <laughs> Then again, the more the merrier, in my opinion. But like a delicious bean burrito, we should wrap this up. Final thoughts, Goose? Well, Rad, while I did appreciate the wackier story and setting, when it comes down to it, Guacamelee 2 is really just more of the same. And honestly, I couldn't be happier. The controls and fighting worked so well in the original that I'm just happy to be spending more time bashing my way through the mechaverse. I'm giving the game four out of five rubber galinas. Ah, uh, that means chickens. Oh, good one, Goose. It's nice to be back in such a beautifully designed world, especially when that same attention to detail is given to the game mechanics. I did find the difficulty spikes quite quickly later in the game, but as long as you have some amigos to help you through, then you're bound to have a bueno time with guacamole too. I'm also giving it four out of five rubber galinas. <laughs> that has a little card in it that says press. You know, I think they're very impressive. Right, well, it's time for the scoop diddy woo the scoop. First up, a powerful typhoon and earthquake hit Japan recently, creating ripple effects into the world of gaming. Due to the earthquake in Hokkaido, a scheduled Nintendo Direct was postponed. A typhoon also struck Nintendo headquarters in Kyoto, leading to the end from the building's sign to fall off. I hope everyone's okay, because I'm sure that's not what was Nintendoed. Next, think you've got what it takes to make it into the Guinness Book of World Records for Minecraft? Well, you might just have a chance. Four special world record attempts in Minecraft have been designed for aspiring record holders, including fastest castle build, fastest to build a rocket, fastest to saddle and stable 10 horses, and fastest to build an igloo. You know what they say, sometimes when it comes to Minecraft, you gotta break ground to break records. What? Well then start saying it. In other news, a free Kingdom Hearts VR experience has been announced. The short interactive video experience is said to feature elements from a number of Kingdom Hearts games, as well as the music from the series. Another trailer was also revealed for Kingdom Hearts 3, which is set to release next year. And now, the extra scoop. This week, a Luigi's Mansion-inspired Labo creation. One of the entrants in Japan's Labo Creators Contest, Isuki Fujinawa, used the Toy Con Garage to create a kind of torch projector hybrid for hunting out booze. Unbelievable! If you've stumbled across something you think is extra scoop worthy, let us know here. Oh, I just thought of another thing that could be really useful for the scoop. You know, one of those bells that you ring when you yell, extra, extra, read all about it. No, too loud? What about a little cowbell? One of the things I love most about gaming is the creative community that surrounds it. And within this are sub-communities that have each found unique and special ways to really celebrate their gaming. And today, I'm exploring one of the fastest subcultures there is, speedrunners. Speedrunning started in the mid-90s, when some games introduced an in-game feature to record demos or short videos of their gameplay. These demos could then be uploaded and shared online. <laughs> It wasn't long before people started uploading demos showing how fast they could complete a game from start to finish. This then led to a bunch of websites tracking the best times. And so, the speedrunning community was born. But they needed to go even faster. So speedrunners started finding ways to break their games, using glitches and exploits they call tricks, allowing them to skip huge chunks of levels. And this has become a big part of speedrunning culture. But where do speedrunners go if they just want to hang out and talk technique or break records with their fellow runners? <laughs> they come here to a speedrunning marathon where they see how fast they can go in a 36-hour session of record-breaking attempts. Let's go check it out. I'm going to walk, though. A speedrunning marathon is, as the name suggests, a live-streamed marathon of back-to-back -back record attempts. This particular marathon is a 36-hour straight event. How long have you been a speedrunner for? Uh, 15 years, actually. I got into it just from uh, playing Mario Kart games. So very naturally, you're trying to go fast in every stage that you're playing. And then I just kind of had the thought, I wonder if I'm really good at this? I wonder if anyone's better. And there were people who were much better. I found some Mario Sunshine speedrun when I was looking for just general gameplay. I was like, this is pretty cool. I followed them years after years, and I found a game that I used to play when I was younger. And I'm like, I wonder if there's a speedrun of this. I looked it up, and I was like, this is easy. I could do this. 
how much practice do you put in to get it to the speed run level that you're happy with? It depends on the game. So a game that doesn't have much mechanical depth, you can maybe just play for an hour or two and then you're ready to do a run. So I had one game or one run in a Pokemon Emerald or Gold Symbols was the category. But I routed it for six months before I ever did a run of it. What does it mean for a speedrunner to have a world record? I think it just means that something they can be really, really proud of. They can go, I achieved that and I did that and I have basically reached the peak. What does it mean to have a record and have someone take it? Do you immediately like go back and die, I have to beat them? Or is it more like, okay, I'll let you take this as I practice more? When it comes to the competition, I do have a huge drive for it. So when someone beats my time, I do feel like it's a necessary thing to jump back in and try and improve it further from there. In the terminology of speedrunners, what are glitches? A glitch is essentially anything that can be exploited by the game that is not explicitly restricted by the developers. Different games also have different ways of doing this. So, for example, a classic game is Mario 64. In that game, there are very few glitches, but there's a lot of exploiting the level design. If a speedrunner were to, you know, find these cool glitches and stuff, do they tend to share their secrets with other speedrunners, or have you found it's more kind of tightly kept? I think people definitely share. Everyone loves sharing their cool findings. I want to try and avoid that text. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use Scratch turn one because that won't take him to below half and then kill him with hidden power just to avoid that little text. It actually saves like three seconds or so. It's a pretty significant amount of time. How important do you think events like this are to the, like, the greater gaming community? I think they're really important because it brings the community together. It's just really nice to be able to get together with a whole bunch of like-minded people and I'm like, I've made a few great friends from this. We all come together as a big family. We all know each other. We like travel together, book hotels together, see other people's uh, speed runs and it's just so great. I love coming to these marathons. What advice would you give to, you know, new speedrunners? What you want to start with, most of all, is a game that you really like. You can see yourself playing multiple times because you will go through multiple resets trying to get your optimal time. Just get involved with the community, play whatever game you feel like playing. It's really just a case of, like, you see a game you like, you play it, you want to get to know to play it faster, get your own personal best times, and then maybe challenge other people to see if you can play it faster than them. Well, this has been amazing. It's so cool to see all the skills you have to have to be a good speedrunner. Stamina, hand-eye coordination, technical understanding, a good memory. But I think what I love most about speedrunning is that it's a community-driven subculture. At its heart, it's one gamer challenging another to be the best at a game they both love. It's cool to slowly explore games and appreciate all the hard work that's gone into them. But sometimes it's fun to see just how fast you can go. Welcome back to the Ask SP desk, Rad. Uh, what's that? Oh, it says it missed you. Oh, I've missed you too, desk. And you too, Goose. Now I'm ready and raring to have a red hot go at answering some of these uh, spicy questions. Uh, what about some mild questions? Oh, yeah, we can add a little chilli powder to them. Sounds All good. All right, well, let's get stuck in with this one from Undyne in Waterfall, Victoria. Hey, I was just wondering if you have ever played Undertale, and if so, liked it, and also if there was any chance that a sequel would be coming out as Toby Fox has been dropping hints. Please do this. Hell, boop, cha ching. Oh, wink, you sign. Mm. P.S. Love your show. Thanks, Undyne. In answer to whether we've played Undertale, well, yes, yes, we have. In fact, we reviewed it twice. Once when it was originally released on PC, and then again last year when it came out for other platforms. There's a lot to like about its quirky characters and sense of humour, and it's great to see the community that's formed around the game. I recall my feelings about Undertale were a bit more mixed, but it's still a highly unique and memorable game. As for whether there'll be a sequel to Undertale, well, I'm not sure. Has the developer been dropping any hints? Because I haven't seen any. But I do hear it's coming to Switch in September. Ooh, well, as we know, the internet community do love to speculate. I believe Toby hinted on the Undertale crowdfunding page a few years ago that if he had leftover funds, he may extend the world of Undertale, possibly with another game. And there has been the odd cryptic social media post over the years, but I haven't seen anything concrete. Hmm, so it seems its very nature is shrouded in darkness, as Toby might say. But moving on to our next question, and it's a video from Jordan. Hey, SB, I've got two questions. One, what is a good Wii game? Two, are there any more Mario games coming up for the Nintendo Switch next year and this year? 
that's all for now. Bye! Oh, thanks, Jordan. Make sure you keep an eye on the email you supplied so we can send you your nifty GGSP pin. Now, to your first question of what is a good Wii game, well, that's a bit of a philosophical one, isn't it? What is a good Wii game? What is a good game? What is it to be good? What is the meaning of life? Oh, these are the questions for the ages. Uh, yeah, but, Rad, we don't actually have ages. So how's about we just name a few good Wii games? Um, there's actually quite a lot. Some I would recommend are the classic Mario titles, like Super Mario Galaxy 1 and 2, New Super Mario Bros Wii, Super Paper Mario, plus the always popular Mario Kart. I also really like Donkey Kong Country Returns, Smash Brothers Brawl, Sonic Colors, Sonic and Sega All-Star Racing, and of course, cutting a rug in any of the Just Dance titles. Oh, and Mario Power Tennis. Now, on to whether there will be any more Mario games for the Switch coming up this year or next year. Well, we do know that Mario will feature in upcoming games like Super Mario Party and Super Smash Bros Ultimate. And there could be some ports of older Mario games, like new Super Mario Bros. U, which is rumoured to be coming to Switch. But whether there will be other new games, we're not so sure. Mm, who knows? Maybe we could see more DLC for Mario Odyssey, or a sequel, or maybe there'll be a new Mario Kart game. No, oh, that's all just speculation for now. It's all a bit pie in the sky. A flying pie? <laughs> cool. Yeah, that would be cool, actually. Uh, now, let's take a look at another question, and this one is from the girl who switched bodies with Rad in wherever the heck Rad is. Oh, I knew I felt funny before. I thought it was just a bad cheese toasty. But it was body swapping. Hi, I have some questions for you. One, why do hackers you do bad things in games want to hack? Two, what is the hardest game ever made? Thanks. P.S. Rad, can I have my body back? Thanks, girl who switched bodies with me. Ugh. I believe we are all switched back into our original respective bodies now, but uh, what a wild ride. As for why some hackers do bad things in games and want to hack, well, it's hard to say without getting inside the mind of a hacker. Yeah, it could be boredom, a desire to show off their technical skills. Uh, some might just want to cheat at a particular game or just cause mischief. Either way, I think we can all agree that it's not cool. And it goes against the very first part of our GGSP motto, which is be nice. So remember, it's best to play games the way they were designed. Now, to the question of the hardest game ever made, mm, well, I'd say that's down to the individual. Different people find different things challenging in gaming. But hey, uh, let's see what Darren has to say now that he's safely back in the cloud and far away from his lasers. Wait, what do you mean Darren was out of the cloud? Uh, oh, no, no, that's just a uh, figure of speech. <laughs> Hello, Darren speaking. Hey, Darren, it's Goose and Rad here. Uh, how are you enjoying your digital existence again? And I mean, not that you have left it. I mean, oh boy. Oh, it's a delight to be back in the cloud amongst all this infinite data. Great, great. Uh, well, just wondering if you know what the hardest game ever made is. Well, a game that a mere squishy human player finds challenging would be a breeze for a pro like myself, of course. But some games that are generally considered to be the hardest of all time include the NES version of Battletoads, which is a beat-em-up style game, a Dwarf Fortress, the fortress-building management sim with roguelike elements where the philosophy is losing its fun, or perhaps Ghouls and Ghosts which actually requires the player to play through the entire game twice to reach the true final ending. Oh, sounds punishing. Affirmative. Some more recent examples of frustratingly challenging games include Getting Over It, Trap Adventure 2, and some levels of Geometry Dash. Oh dear, I will not forget playing those anytime soon. Eh, eh. Eh, dun dun dun. Uh, what do you find the most difficult, Darren? Rad, are you forgetting that I am a master of gaming? Nothing is too difficult for Darren, but it was rather difficult to bid adieu to my lasers upon returning to the cloud recently. So much so, it inspired me to start developing an app to enable wireless laser control, meaning I could soon laser noobs for days for the comfort of my very own Digisphere. Oh, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, okay, thanks Darren, bye. Uh, well, on that terrifying note, we are out of time. If you'd like to send us a question, then you can go here. And remember, the best way to score yourself a GGSP pin is to send us a video question and see if it gets picked. Goose, did something happen with Darren while I was away? Uh, I don't know what you're talking about, Rad. <laughs> That's, uh, what's that over there? Is that, is that popcorn? Is that a popcorn fountain? Someone just left popcorn? <laughs> that was close. At Two Point Hospital, over 52% of our patients believe they leave healthier than when they arrived. 
Our precisely calibrated equipment is operated by compassionate healthcare practitioners, many of whom have even been to medical school or watched ER. We're building a brighter, safer future, and hardly anything will stand in our way. Two Point Hospital is a business management simulator in which you design and run a network of quirky hospitals. This is a spiritual successor to a 1997 game called Theme Hospital, which means it was developed with some of the same elements and ideas, but isn't a direct sequel. However, the similarities are certainly there. And in fact, some of the people who worked on Theme Hospital also worked on Two Point Hospital too. Woo! Theme Hospital is so popular, it's been re-released a number of times over the years to the delight of Sim fans everywhere. <laughs> and as a fan myself, I'm extra delighted that we now have a new version in Two Point Hospital. Oh, I've been waiting for this. Yeah, you've been excited about this for ages. I never played Theme Hospital, but even so, it's really easy to get into the swing of things. You start by designing and furnishing rooms of the hospital, hiring staff and watching the money roll in. As you progress, you'll unlock more and more treatment rooms for different diseases. And the best part is, they're full of jokes. You'll be curing grey anatomy, a condition which sucks the colour from patients' lives, with a careful spray of paint. Or treating patients who mistakenly think they're a rock star. It's all very silly, yet clever, and humour is something I really loved about Theme Hospital, so I'm glad to see it's still around. Yeah, it really sets the mood for a fun game. And though the game is silly, the business management is serious. Serious business. Real serious business. There's a high degree of control over how you can direct your employees, and everything from what room you put them in to their individual personality traits will affect their performance. It's a lot to take in. <laughs> and if that's not enough, you also have to manage the hospital itself. For example, temperature needs to be controlled on certain maps, and placing plants and posters increases hospital attractiveness and prestige. When people are happy with their surroundings, their work improves. Yeah, speaking of which, is that why you blanketed every wall in clown posters? Yeah, it's an easy way to beautify the hospital. I support you as a friend, but I hate the clown posters so much. <laughs> well, then you are not going to be a fan of Jest Infection. Jest Infection is no laughing matter. Put your trust and oversized shoes in our capable hands. <laughs> but you're absolutely right, Jem, when you say that the business management is serious. And it's what's so great about this game. The early levels are easy to succeed in, giving you a taste. Then things slowly escalate until you're in a huge hospital that you're scrambling to keep afloat. Yeah, I definitely got lulled into a false sense of security early on. And the game does have some flaws that I'm hoping get patched later down the line. Patients and doctors sometimes wander off, causing excessively long queues that don't seem to move. And it seems that patients won't go for treatment without a 100% diagnosis, meaning they keep getting referred back to the GP again and again. <laughs> You have clearly got lightheadedness, my dude. Go get it fixed. Yeah, and it does mean that you'll be constructing about a thousand GPs officers, which you have to do individually and manually. But I actually didn't mind. I've played about 20 hours now and it hasn't gotten frustrating yet. It just would be nice if I didn't have to. Totally, and the devs seem very active in taking feedback and trying to improve the game. So I look forward to it being a bit smoother with an update. And the gameplay itself is still really engaging. You're encouraged to try different tactics and expand on what you've learned with each new hospital. You can, of course, go back to one of your earlier hospitals at any time, but new ones are unlocked at a comfortable pace. There's nothing like abandoning a hospital that's starting to struggle for a fresh start in a new city. Yeah, I can't move on until I've three-starred a hospital, but I'm enjoying feeling that level of investment because I'm not usually a completionist in games. Objectives provide enjoyable challenge, but also encourage you to learn all about the different elements of the game. It makes me want to learn how to be a better hospital magnate. Speaking of hospital magnets, Gem, I am so stoked on this game. It's got the soul that I love from Theme Hospital, but with some 2018 improvements and a new look of paint. Totally, I can see why you were so excited for its release. Two Point Hospital has a really satisfying gameplay loop and a wicked sense of humour. If you suffer from turtle head, let us ease your worries and noggin gently out of your body. It's challenging, it's detailed, and just makes me feel good inside. I'm giving it four and a half out of five rubber chickens. Oh, I'm so glad that you liked it and that something that I love has been given you life and done right. 
I love the scope it gives for how you want to run things. You can zone out and be a bit hands-off, or constantly be pausing the game to micromanage every tiny detail. I'll be playing heaps of this for a while to come. I'm giving it five out of five rubber chickens. Doctor needed in GP's office. I'm a PhD! I'm a vet! <laughs> I guess you could say that game was just what the doctor ordered. Yeah, it's sick. The good kind of sick. Next week on the show, we're going to take a little trip down to Donut County. Plus the hair-raising rally racing of the Rally 4. Now, Rad, you promised to tell us more about your eSports odyssey. Yes, next week on ABC Me, right after Good Game Spawn Point, come with me on a special journey to the other side of the planet as I make my way to the Dota 2 International in Vancouver, Canada. I'm going to show you the sights and take you behind the scenes for the passion and drama of one of the world's biggest eSports events. Well, it really was a dream come true. Well, make sure not to miss it. Until then, goose out. Rad out. Gem out.